It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Randall Maxwell is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. Hi, my name is Randall Maxwell. I was a producer on the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series from 1991 to 1996. My favorite story is D-Day Plus 50, which commemorated the 50th anniversary of D-Day on the battleship Texas. Several veterans who had been on the Texas showed up. I was able to talk to them, get their stories, their experiences, visit parts of the ship with them, and it moved me to hear this historical retrospective and coming directly from memories of these veterans. My father was a veteran. It meant a lot to the veterans uh, to tell their story, and it really impacted me uh, for years to come. When I landed on that beach that day, the noise was tremendous. The shells are going off everywhere. Men are dying, getting killed, getting hit, wounded. And frankly, I was terrified. The year was 1944. The event, Operation Overlord. D-Day had arrived, a full-scale invasion coast of France by Allied forces trying to bring freedom to Europe. The USS Texas was there. Whole bow of the ship would be down under the water as it bounced up and down. It would throw so much water back up all the way to the bridge where, where we would be here on the signal bridge. And it would throw enough water up on the signal bridge that it slammed you against the deck. Whenever the guns went off in that turret, why? It um, nearly shook you off of the ship, and uh, my phones flew off of my head and scared me half to death, and he had to grab me and hold me, I think, the first time. My ears rang for about three weeks after it was all over, and of course, at the end of the day, our faces were black from the gunpowder, and uh, it was really quite a show. A survivor of two world wars, the battleship Texas now rests proudly next to the San Jacinto Monument near Houston. But on this day, the 50th anniversary of D-Day, veterans have come to the Texas to remember their fallen comrades and a ship that changed their lives. Interesting time, a scary time, frequently. When I think of it now, I think of just how fortunate we were, those of us who did survive, because there was shells landing all around us. For many veterans, images of D-Day are still very clear. I scooped out a shallow spot that I could get closer to, to the earth with. And John Hooper was in the Army and part of the infantry assault at Omaha Beach. German artillery was landing in that area, and about five seconds later, one came a little closer, and another five seconds, another one came closer. And I said to myself, Hooper, if you don't get out of here, you're going to get the next one. So I got up and crawled and sort of ran or whatever I could do forward about 20 or 30 yards. Flopped down again when I heard another shell coming in and it exploded behind me. As I turned around to look to see where it hit and it hit that ramp that I just got off of. Men were still climbing off of that ramp. Pieces of the ramp flew into the air. It must have killed several of them. When we did get to the beach over there, we had to feel a way along to be sure we didn't hit a landmine. There were so many of them. You just sweat it out real good. They asked us if we had, uh, were Navy or Marines or what, you know, and said, no, we're Navy. He said, well, get all the ammo you can. We need all the help we can out here. 
So uh, never did see that person anymore. It's very emotional. I mean, you know, you just, after, after it, you leave these things, then it gets real tough. Alongside the guns, explosions, and chaos, the men on the battleship Texas were comforted by a voice, that of Chaplain LeGrand Moody. Captain of the ship called me in prior to the invasion. He said, Chaplain, more than 60% of our crew is below decks when we're at battle stations. And he says, I want you to come up to the bridge and take the loudspeaker system that goes all through the ship, take that microphone, and give a blow-by-blow -blow description of any action that we get into. First, the airplanes came over and dropped bombs on the beach, and then there were ships shooting. It looked like a gigantic Fourth of July. I, I, I'm reminded of some words by Louis L'Amour, the great Western writer. He said, there's nothing like gun smoke and sweat to draw men together. And you find that on a ship. I mean, we were, the jobs that we had, those men were sweating, and the gun smoke was everywhere. The crew on this ship were like members of extended family, like some of your cousins or your brothers. And if you've watched this group around here, you'll see them shake hands and, oh, so glad to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you since so-and-so. There's just something special about the Texas. So was the Texas your first ship after the transport on the Wyoming? That's right. Architect Steve Files has spent many hours on restoration efforts aboard the Texas. On this D-Day anniversary, he's tapping into the minds of veterans and researching parts of the ship rarely seen by visitors. These guys are still the guys who were in the spaces. They know what they did. They know what their buddies did. It's just like being in, <laughs> like being in jail. You couldn't get out of here until that was over with. <laughs> I think as far as going to a specific space, it, it's really good to get these guys down there because that can trigger memories that they don't even realize they've got. We're getting close to it now. Steering aft, where all the quartermasters lived. If you want to call it that. Uh, this is true deja vu. I was coming off watch, and uh, at midnight, I went past the galley, and I had seen this wooden box with the uh, armor's uh, ham on it. And when I got it down here, which was quite a feat, bringing it down three decks, we lowered it down. I think I asked somebody to help me. In any event, when we got it down here, we found out it was bacon. You see where the light is here? Yeah. That was all open, and you could literally go in there, and I hid it back there until the heat uh, subsided, maybe a month or so. Okay, I never thought I'd ever see this again. Getting that real close to the very stern. The skin of the ship was where, and this is where the rudder pierces the skin of the ship. That little story I was telling you, this is where I hid the bacon. I never thought I'd ever be back here. This is truly quite a sensation. For some veterans who served aboard the Texas, Coming home was as overwhelming as the battle itself. My family in Kentucky had heard on the radio that the Texas had been sunk. And I went home with my family thinking that I probably was dead. And I walked in and I suppose you can imagine what their surprise was. They were in shock. I didn't realize myself that the Texas had been reported some at the time. And of course they were crying and laughing. I guess we all got pretty emo emotional at that time. Crawling across that beach with, with the dead and wounded lying all over, wondering if I'm gonna make it. Fortunately, we did. And we were really thankful for the Navy for being able to 
silence those shore defenses. That was wonderful. I would like to meet the Navy chaps just to let them know that, well, hey, here, I survived. <laughs> My name is Henley. I was Henley. on the USS Texas during the invasion in Normandy. I was the director corner for the secondary battery on the port side, and I actually closed the cave when the guns fired, and I had a good telescope up there, and I could see everything and see what was going on on the beach. Amazing. That's interesting. I'm certainly grateful for your support because my name is John Hooper, and I landed with the 29th on a sector called, we were supposed to land on a sector called Easy Green, but we landed on Easy Red on Omaha Beach. We were certainly grateful for your fire support. I'll always Maybe. remember this day. I shall too. <laughs> 50 years, the blink of an eye, memory that last a life.